Good evening, everyone, and you're all very welcome to tonight's webinar, which has been brought to you tonight by the advisory staff here in County Mayo. My name is Brendan Gary. I work in Chagas and Ballinrobe, and tonight for the next hour, I'm delighted to be your host for this evening's webinar. Now, this is the third episode in our current spring webinar series, and tonight the focus switches to spring dairy management. And with Kevin kicked off on Irish dairy farms, tonight we'll be discussing some of the key issues facing Irish dairy farmers this spring. Tonight, our first speaker will be Donald Kelly, a local dairy advisor from Chagas and Clare Morris, and Donald will give us advice on fertilizer usage, along with some reminders about grass utilization this spring. By later this evening, our guest speaker will be Magella McCafferty from the Arriva Farm Profitability Team. And Magella will tell us how to keep these calves that are being born this week on Irish dairy farms healthy this spring, along with reminding us what to watch out for as regards early lactation mastitis in freshly calved cows. Now you, the viewers, are being encouraged to engage with our panelists here tonight, and we ask you to type your questions into the Q&A function at the bottom of your screens, and later this evening, Vivian Silk, the Chagas Regional Manager here in County Mayo, will put your questions live to our panellists. So please type your questions into the Q&A function. Now, this webinar has been recorded and will be available to watch back in the coming days on the Chagas Mayo YouTube channel. So without further delay, I'm now going to ask you, Donald, to start sharing your presentation with us. And it's over to you now, Donald. Sound. Cheers, Brendan. You can see that all right, you can. That's perfect now, Donald. Yeah, thank you very much for that. Okay. Hey everyone. Hello all. Um, as Brendan said, uh, my name is Donald Kelly. I'm the local Chagas Dairy Advisor here in Clamaris. Um, the presentation is basically on spring grazing and nutrient management. Now, it'll be, I suppose, mainly focused on nutrient management and spring grazing, but I'm going to focus on the nitrogen rather than the P&K. But if there's any questions, you can throw them out and we'll try and answer them. I suppose just to look at the year, um, the year coming, uh, 2022, I just said, let's give a bit of context. Uh, the strength, strong milk price um, at the moment, which is always good. Um, looking back the la back into last year, um, here with a fairly mild September, growth rates are very good. Speaking to most lads on the ground, good graze outs were got um, on the final rotation without damaging our poaching ground too much, to which, and good resi residuals were achieved. Looking over the winter, winter was very mild, high growth rates, which resulted in a lot of grass, I suppose, on farms at the moment. Now, looking at that grass, Grass is still fairly fresh, like it's fairly green down to the bush. Um, die back, you can see it kind of happened in the last few days, definitely. Um, and we'll talk about what the nitrogen will do on that later during the slides. Also, looking at the moment, I i don't think I've seen ground conditions as good as this in a long time, but this time of year, um, and hopefully they'll hold out for a while. Definitely looking at challenges. Um, input prices are up on, uh, on a lot of things. Um, but in particular here, the talking point is um, fertilizer in terms of nitrogen costs have spired. Um, also challenges looking forward in terms of trying to um, achieve these emission targets and also in terms of biodiversity and water quality in terms of um, trying to improve those also. So let's dive into it. I suppose the first question I do get asked is lately the phone anyway is, for example, some lads might have fertilizer left over from last year, um, can-based fertilizers, urea-based fertilizer, protected urea. What should we use on the first um, application for nitrogen? This table really Hold on, just a minute, this other way. Um, this table here was a study that was done before. Uh, what it does basically is um, highlights the efficiency of can versus for, um, urea in different climatic conditions. Okay, so the nutrient use efficiency of can and urea um, at different air, air temperatures and different rainfall levels 72 hours post application. Okay, so just to explain the table, if a figure is over 100 on the table, urea was more efficient in that circumstances. So just take this one, for example, the 117. Um, it was on average five degrees, um, on average 72 hours post the uh, nitrogen application, and it was 15 millimeters of rain that fell. So it's above the 100, it was 17% more efficient to use urea in that circumstances compared to can. If we take it up to here, which would be a lovely temperature to have in spring, um, it would be 68, okay? So can would have won in that circumstance, okay? Now, just to make this table a bit more relevant for this time of year, I've yet to see a spring. Um, two seconds, I'll turn off this thing. Um, I yet to see a spring with 20 degrees Celsius. I've yet to see a spring with 15 degrees Celsius. And well, maybe this January is the only time I've seen a very little amount of rainfall. Okay. So if we look at the scenarios, two out of the 12 scenarios only can was an advantage. So our advice really is use urea. Preferably protected urea, but if you can't get that, use urea on your first and second splits in spring. It's more suited for the conditions you'll have in spring in terms of the moisture levels and the temperature that will um, most likely happen 72 hours post um, application of nitrogen. Okay. So 
Protected urea will work in all these scenarios. That's why it was developed. That's why an inhibitor was put on it, that the uh, protected urea will work here at high temperatures, um, at moderate level of rainfall, and at low levels of rainfall. Okay, that's why it was developed. And um, so ideally, we would be using protected urea. And also, in terms of hitting our greenhouse gas emissions, um, protected urea is one of the main tools we have in the armory to achieve in those um, reductions. So if we look at it in terms of if we look at it in terms of when, when do we go with nitrogen? Okay, well, first of all, I suppose is we should definitely look at the weather forecast. Here, it's the most common sense thing to think of. Okay, is there a lot of rain forecast? Clearly, we shouldn't be going with nitrogen. Paddock uh, trafficability. Okay, if we can't travel on the ground with the tractor and the fertilizer spreader, it's very simple. It shouldn't be putting nitrogen on that ground. Um, soil temperature here. I suppose the I suppose the advice on that would be that. The ground temperature should be at least five to six degrees and rising. Okay, so if we take this week, for example, and you're going around with a probe checking the temperature and it was four degrees on Monday, four degrees on Tuesday, and it was six degrees on Wednesday, don't suddenly run back and get the fertilizer spreader. You want six degrees continuously for a few days and rising. Um, I have grass 10 and pasture base there, and there's a great tool on that. It's the predictive model for grass growth. Um, if you go on pasture base there, it can show you what the predicted growth rate will be for the next week. So if you keep an eye on that and you see that, well, the growth rates are going to increase um, next week on that, it's a sure sign, well, temperatures are going to in increase as well. Um, targeted fields. So again, if we took, for example, a 60-acre milking platform, um, and here every harm has wetter ground with the milking platform, say there was 10 acres out the back that was a bit wet don't base your fertilizer decisions on the 10 wet acres we should be basing it on our good 50 acres right that's left um i see that a lot okay even if i'm brought to a farm i see how lots of ground conditions like and i'm always brought to the wettest part of the farm so go out look see which paddocks maybe should be getting fertilizer okay so they might be for example the recently receded fields they might be ones with very good grazing infrastructure high levels for any ryegrass if you had soil samples done you're maybe targeting this nitrogen fertilizer on your um high P and K, high P and K fields and high line fields. Okay, so they'll respond a lot better to that nitrogen. Um, again, you'd be hoping to put, if you're going to rear that they might have a cover on them, roughly 400 kilos dry matter or six centimeters graph would roughly be nice if you had a bit of a cover on that. Um, again, in terms of cattle slurry, a lot of slurry gone on there lately, but if we're putting out cattle slurry, like it should be targeted what's going on the milking platform. So I often see you get soil samples back and you, you look at the map when you get the soil samples back and the few paddocks around the shed are indexed four for P and K. Why? Because the slurry are going on them. But this year, maybe if you had soil samples, look at them and say, Joe, well, actually, there's a few other fields that are low on P and K. If you're putting slurry on the milking platform, put them on them. You'll get a better response than putting them on an index three and index uh, four soils. Just in terms of slurry, I have low LESS, that means low emission slurry spread in here. Every dairy farm should be using low emission if possible here. You get a lot better residuals in terms of graze outs on the next rotation in terms of grazing, but also you're getting an extra three or four units, roughly, give or take, on your 1,000 gallons versus just splash plate. So there you're getting your extra nitrogen. Um, also here, if you want, roughly want a rough figure here, um, an extra 2,000 gallon tanker with low emission would give you roughly 16, 18 units nitrogen. Okay, so you're talking about eight or nine units for every 1,000 gallons with a low emission spreader. Uh, so that's when we should be going with nitrogen, roughly keeping it in the back of our head when we're going to do them applications. So this is an interesting table. Um, I suppose I've answered when we should go with nitrogen. I suppose if I answered what artificial nitrogen we should be going with, and maybe the question I should have been answered first is, does it pay to go with the nitrogen with the current costs, right? Um, this table here, I'm just going to talk through it. Um, so just want to get a pointer here. So. This table here on the left just shows that the different um, costs per ton of urea, what the actual cost per pure kilo or nitrogen is um, in that uh, ton. So, for example, if we took urea at 950 a ton, the pure kilo or nitrogen is costing around two euros and seven cents, say two euro ten. For example, if you had can at 700 a ton, it's costing around two euro sixty per pure kilo or nitrogen. Now, we've always known that urea was always cheaper for pure kilo or nitrogen, but with the changes in fertilizer prices, a larger gap has, has, um, has emerged between the two. So just for this working example, I'm going to go with um, urea at 950 a ton. So roughly cost around two euro 10 per pure kilo or nitrogen. So what level of response of grass do we need to get to pay to put out um, urea at 950 a ton? Okay. Well, we need to look at first what's the value of spring grass. 
over the last few years, we've been using 16 cent per kilo of spring grass. So for example, to replace that grass, how much would it cost? 16 cent, okay? So if we go at two euro 10, we look along here, we need to get a response between 12 and 15 kilos of uh, dry matter of grass um, for every kilo of nitrogen, okay? So 12 to 15 response. Now, I suppose to develop on that really, um, the cost of spring grass will have increased this year, really, in terms of replacing. Like if you were to replace that grass, the high UFL grass with good protein, to replace that with silage and meal, it's going to cost a lot more than previous years. So I would actually actually say that spring grass is actually costing nearly 20 cents to replace. And the dearer the spring grass goes, the less response we need. Now, I might be making that a bit more complicated, but it's roughly here. We'll keep it simple between 12 and 15 kilos of response. So that's what we're looking for. And now the next question is, well, will we get it? And I'll go on to the next slide here to show that. Um, bear with me. So this was an experiment that was done um, in Chagas looking at, I suppose, the response to different levels of nitrogen. Um, now just to make this table easier, I, I suppose here before I do that, I'll just explain it. We put out different levels of nitrogen um, at different rates um, at different splits. So just to make it simple, I'll go with this example. So we put 60 kilos of grams of nitrogen out and within that experiment, we ran three experiments. So we said, well, so 60 kilos of nitrogen is around 48 units to the acre. Um, will we put no, none of that nitrogen out in February and we put all the nitrogen out in March, which I'm getting kind of quinning and about uh, calls about at the moment. Well, we just hold off, put the nitrogen out in March, we'll get a better response. But we'll see, is that the actual case? Um, the other trial then we put half the half the 48 units out in the first week of February and we put the other half out on the 16th of March. Or then we went with another idea. We put one third of the 48 units out the first week of February and we put the other two thirds out um, the 16th of March. Now, just a reminder, this is not the recommended, and not, we're not recommending this amount of fertilizer to go out on farms, okay? This was just a trial um, that was done, okay? So just we said we calculate this out a bit easier to read so the question might be do we put all 48 units out on the 16th of march and no nitrogen in february or do we put one third of that 48 units out in february and put the other two thirds of the 48 units out the 16th of march so we're putting the same amount of fertilizer out on both areas but we're just literally splitting it into all out in march or one third in february and two thirds in march which will grow more grass okay let's talk through it so the application where we put the 48 units out on the 16th of March gave a response of 14 kilos of dry mash per hectare. So it paid for itself and it grew 840 kilos of grass. Great. Now let's look at the one third, two thirds. We put one third of the 48 units out in early February and we put two thirds of it out in March. We grew 1100 kilos of dry matter. So we grew 260 kilos more grass by using the same amount of nitrogen, but putting it in two different splits, okay? We grew more in March and we grew obviously more in February. So let's put into practical terms, what does that actual amount of feed mean in the farm? So well, don't like it's 260 kilos of grass. Can break it down to me and tell me what that'll feed. 260 kilos of grass. Um, if we were to break it down, roughly a farmer stocked at three cows the hectare on the Minton platform would roughly give another 12 grazes or six days at grass. So roughly 14 kilos of grass going in per diet per day. Okay, so nearly six, say nearly a week extra grazing, which is a lot. So the same amount of fertilizer, but just putting out a one third, two third split, give an extra week grazing um, for a last stock of three cows the hectare. Okay, now if you were to look back last April, where the growth rates didn't come, we were hoping on the start of the second round, and you were to say to someone, well, there's an extra week's grazing there for you, um, they'd be delighted to hear it. So it was a very interesting experiment, um, and it was very interesting data to come out of it. So and um, that's the results on that any questions on that you can send them in to brendan on the chat okay so and um, that's basically how we grow the grass the most important thing then is it's all right to grow it we need to use it um so if we were to look at this graph here this graph basically shows the effect of spring grazing on dry matter productions okay so how are lads growing more grass in spring than others is it because we're putting on more nitrogen. Yes, that might be one reason, but the main reason is because it's being grazed more. So if we look at this graph here, if we look at this graph here, 
Um, on the left, you can see the top 25% of lads are growing roughly 2.5 tonne of grass in the spring, and the bottom 25%, and that's not saying it's bad, it's just looking at comparisons, are growing 1.5 tonne. Why is the difference in that? When we looked at the data, the lad growing the extra tonne was grazing roughly the paddocks 1.5 tonnes in, times in spring, and the lads growing a tonne less were only grazing 0 .9, uh, 0 0.9, roughly 0 0.85, give or take, times in spring, okay? So we're grazing the grass more, we grow more in spring, okay? So it's very important that we get out of that grass. And there was always, there's always a figure thrown around, and it is true when you look into it, that every day of grass is worth €2.70 per cow per day, okay, in spring. So, so it's about getting that grass into the cow efficiently. The spring rotation planner does that for us, okay? It sets out um, targets to achieve this grass utilisation. Um, so roughly the dates we will be using mainly a lot of farms um, around this area would definitely be on the right-hand side there. So here so if we said roughly if we could start grazing by the 15th of february and have at least 30 35 percent graze by the 15th of march depending on your calving pattern okay um it's a hard target to hit but um it's the most important uh, target to hit and i'll explain that in a minute why again then have another third give or take graze by the 27th of march and roughly get, or start the second rotation by the 15th of april here drier farms may go around 10 days earlier than that okay but that's roughly a ro uh, spring rotation planner if you broke them down into that, your uh, milking platform and set them targets for your spring grazing, um, it would help an awful lot and at least it'll give you a plan going forward. Okay, so the next thing, if, okay, we know how much of an area we need to graze, but we need to know, well, what paddocks are we going to? So this is just a roughly a grass wedge, maybe of a meadow farm, okay? Showing that, well, what type of covers are on the farm at the moment? So if we look at here, these are the heaviest covers here. Um, for probably 14, 14, 15 uh, kilos dry matter up to 2,000. You're looking at your, then you're looking at these green covers here, which are probably roughly your, give or take your 800s up to 1,200s. And then you have your lower covers here, which are around on your 600s. So which ones do we go to? Um, ideally, um, when you're starting your grazing, you go to these paddocks here first. Okay, you go to your lower covers. Why? Because we want to graze as much area as we can at the start of the rotation. That's key number one. Area graze is the most important. So if we graze lower covers, we'll go to more area. So if I was going to a two-acre field at 2,000 cover versus um, a two-acre paddock with 1,000 cover, I'll only cover half the area because there's more feed to get. Plus, also, we want to train cows into grazing. So we let cows out into heavy covers. They're just going to walk it into the ground. If we light them out into nice, kind of lighter, leafier covers, we'll train them into grazing. Okay. Um, so that's very important. And we need to hit our residuals as well. So them covers will train the cows into getting good residuals as well. Sorry, no. Um, slightly frozen. Okay, so I suppose the first kind of consideration, we don't ever panic uh, when you're letting cows out in spring, okay? Like it's, it's going to be maybe messy for the first two or three days, but try and get them out, okay? Um, have flexibility. I suppose what paddocks are we going to go to? We're going to go to our paddocks where there's good grazing infrastructure. We always said we're going to go to our paddocks where there's lower covers. We're going to go to our drier fields, okay? But also maybe don't go all, all to the drier fields straight away. Like if you look at the weather at the moment, you have these ground conditions, like go where you can, when you can, get the dry paddocks when it's wet, but get the wet paddocks when it's dry, you know? Um, use your on-off grazing, like it is the tool for achieving spring targets, but you need to be very careful how, an ex how it's executed in terms of dietary, like letting cows out with a full belly of grass, cows ain't going to hit the residuals you want. Again, using 12-hour breaks as well is very important, again, in terms of um, hitting these residuals as well. Um, I suppose why do we even bother? Why do we even bother letting cows out to spring grass? Like it's very important. Like it's in, biggest one is really in terms of animal performance. Like your the spring grass you have, you're not going to have better grass than that all year round. It's extremely high in energy. It's really good dry matter grass and extremely high in protein. So it helps cows hit that peak uh, milk yield that you're looking for. Okay, it's 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 obviously healthier to have cows out as well if you can in terms of somatic cell count and Magella will be covering that later on. So having cows out, we're obviously going to better than stuck inside in the cubicle shed as well. We're going to reduce costs on farm. If cows are eating grass, we can reduce the amount of meal that's going in the diet and we can reduce the amount of um, reduce the amount of uh, silage that's going into the diet 
and reduce other cost, costs, for example, slurry spread and all that is included as well. I suppose I mentioned that at the start of the presentation as well, that, for example, um, we have greenhouse gas emissions to uh, targets to achieve as well. So spring grazing will help with this. And I have figures written down because I couldn't remember them, to be honest, and then written them up here. So if we could get out cows spring earlier, spring grazing and reduce our greenhouse gases by 2%. If we use protected urea, for example, we can reduce our greenhouse gases by 8%, low emission, another 2%. And getting cows out to grass a week, another week that we don't usually get them out, another one percent. So, it's interesting the strategies we have, strategies we have to reduce greenhouse gases, also make us more money on farm as well, which is um, which is very important, you know. So it's a win-win scenario. Um, so, Brendan, I think that's my presentation done. I think I'm on the 2021 20, minutes. That's brilliant, Donald. Look, thank you very much for that, Donald. So, I'll just get you just to stop sharing your presentation. Yeah, and indeed, right. and. and and um, thank you very much for that, Don. That was a brilliant presentation. We have a lot of farmers on this evening now there. So I'd encourage you there, um, ladies and gentlemen, to put your questions into the Q&A function. Um, you, you can type your question in there and we will pick up the questions um, after Magella's presentation. So now at this stage, I'm now going to call on our guest speaker, Magella McCafferty. Uh, Magella works in the Arrivo Farm Profitability Team. And Magella, I'll hand it over to you now to start sharing your presentation with us. That's perfect, Brendan. Yeah, I work in the Revo um, Farm Profitability, so um, I've got a few topics that I just like to cover. I think it's fitting for tonight. Um, there's obviously a lot more detail we could go into, but with, with the short time we have, um, I'm just going to try and, and get as much information out there as possible. And if there's any questions or anyone um, would like to uh, come in and, and ask any questions, there's no problem at all. Um, fly through quickly with a lot of information so I'd be hoping that um, we can kind of just smidge over the top of it and then if there's any uh, questions afterwards then we can dive more into it. That's perfect. No, Jello, that's perfect. Okay so you can see everything there running your hand. Yeah. So I suppose the first thing we need to look at um, is this even this calving season or this spring I suppose with the high inputs of cost and things that's going on at the moment and the way regulations are changing the easiest way for all farmers to start saving money is to start actually measuring what's going on on their farm. So this year and every other year going forward, at least this year, we can start off and start to measure the different things that's happening that can make very big um, impacts on your farm and lower your costs. So if you're not measuring it, you can't manage it. So by measuring, then we can look into the different areas and the different, I suppose, topics that you can cover in all the dairy management and have a look at them and start to measure where we're going. Um, if we have a measurement starting off now, then next year we can improve on it, the following year we can improve on it, and every other year we can improve on it. But if we don't have any statistics and we don't have any measurements, then we don't actually know how we're getting on. So this kind of brings me on, I suppose, to the first topic, which is um, calf care. Um, the colostrum management is key um, to everything. I suppose it's the stepping stone that where you're starting in your dairy management. So the first thing you need to do is get those calves right, get them on the ground, get your um, replacement heifers uh, as strong and as ready to go as you possibly can. If we don't measure, we kind of just say, oh yeah, well, you know, there, I had so many calves this year. Um, my calves were at such weight, they got such amount of colostrum, but we don't actually know, then we kind of can't make the improvements because we haven't got the measurements on the ground. So firstly, we are, we're always trying to get the colostrum into the cow within the first, or into the calf, sorry, within the first two hours of birth. We're going to use the colostrum from the first milk in for the first feed. We're going to give the colostrum within the first two hours of birth. And calves that do not get enough antibodies after their birth will have failed passive um, transfer, which basically means that every single hour after that two hours, you're reducing the chances that they're going to get as many antibodies into them, which is basically their immune system. So as many hours as you leave out that they don't get it, the more, the less, sorry, antibodies is going to be in their system and the less stronger of immune system they're going to have. Give at least three liters or three liters within 12 hours. So that's a very important factor um, to give the first three liters initially and then three liters in the first hours. Now it does depend on, on body weight, and you're always looking for a percentage um, of the body weight. So if you have your calves weighed, then you're given 10% of the body weight. Um, the calves here, sorry, I can't actually see this. It's gone, gone away on here. Um, the calf 
um, should, ha should have um, be standing within the first 20 minutes. So you should be able to actually see the calf getting up or doing something within the first 20 minutes. If they're not getting up within the first 20 minutes, you need to start looking immediately at what's actually going on and why they're not up in the 20 minutes. Mixing powder correctly is so important. Um, there's some requirements. The temperature uh, needs to be at 55 degrees to generate the correct heat. So it's really, really important to look at the back of um, the powders, see how you're mixing them, what's going on, and I suppose the effects it's having on the calves. So it's one major area um, that there's problems with um, if it's not mixed correctly. It needs a certain amount of heat to generate the protein so that the calf is going to get the right feed. So if you're going to be feeding the powder, you need to be feeding it at exact temperatures and um, making sure that it's mixed correctly, because otherwise you're going to be feeding and you're not going to get the full potential out of the powder. Um, the next thing here we have is targeted weights for calves. So trying to weigh your calves, I suppose, is really important. Um, if you don't have a weighing scale, the easiest way to do it is there's a calf measurement tape. So you can get a tape and just measure them maybe once a week or even in batches or, you know, if you want to do it twice a week or, or even once a month to start off with. I know it's a really busy time in calving, but if you could have a measurement for them, maybe once a month even just to see how are they going, how much weight are they gaining, how many grams are they gaining, um, how much are they drinking and how much are they eating? Although we know by looking at it, at least if we have a measurement on them, we can try and figure out then, well, why are they not putting on this weight? Why are they not reaching these growth rates? And why are they kind of lagging behind? Or why is some of them lagging behind? Why do I have a batch of heifers that isn't hitting their targets? And why do I have another batch here that are flying ahead with them? So to double the calf birth weight by eight weeks, so that's one, one of your targets. You're trying to double the calf birth. So if we don't have a fair idea what the calf birth or the weights are, even in the first week, what the average weight of the herd, and it'll differ depending on the different breeds in the herds and the different types um, of breeding, then we don't actually know where we are. So in the beginning, and then we get, uh, we know that by, eight, sorry, week eight, that we've doubled it 40 kilos to 80 kilos in 56 days. So if you even did it within the first time and then within 56 days, then we'd know how we were getting on the calf mortality rate of less than 3%. So that's your target over a 12 week period. If it's over this, then what we need to start measuring is, well, why is it over this? Why is the calf mortality rate higher than 3%? What's happening? We need to write down, well, we've had four or five calves here. We say touch wood never happens, but four or five calves, there's a mortality rate here. They're dying. Why did they die? Did they die in the first day? Did they die on day three? Was it from a scour? What was the signs? And just by measuring those and, and recording them, then next year we can look at that and say, well, okay, this was what our mortality rate was last year, but the year coming forward, we're going to start working on that to try and fix what the problem was. If we don't have a measurement to see well, ha what's actually happening here, then we can't actually turn around and say, well, okay, we'll have to look into ventilation, we'll look into bedding, we'll look into facilities. Maybe there's too many calves in a pen with too much air, you know, there's not enough air regulation. There's something going on, but unless you measure it, then we can't go to the next step and ask why. So I have here the five whys. So firstly, it's about figuring out and measuring what's actually going on. And then you're asking the five whys to go down to say, well, why is this happening? And then continue on so that eventually you'll get to the root cause of it. And if you get to the root cause of it, then you'll improve it year on year on year. Um, the water intake is another problem, I suppose, that we would see a lot. 20 calves needs two water points in the actual group. So if you have 20 calves, you need to be getting at least um, two water points within that group because that will help your growth rates and it will also help you for the calves to be thriving from day one on. So I have it there. There's uh, computer feeders as well um, have shown in research so research done um, has shown 12 to 15 calves per group in the pen, and then computerized feeders show 300 mil per minute to 1.2 uh, liters per minute. So that's how much they're actually drinking on their own. So they're going up to that, getting the water, computerized in this research, and that's what it's shown, 300 mil per minute. Um, so the next slide we have then, I'm just going to co cover briefly over um, colostrum management. So obviously, classroom management is one of the biggest players in any farm, but particularly in dairy farms. So if we look here on this side here, on the left, we have the total solid percentage, the fat, 
the protein, the antibodies, the lactose, the minerals, and the vitamin A. So the milking numbers, how many milkings? Now, we've done here, this is Chagas research as well, and it was done one, two, three, and then it has milk in 11. So you can see here in milk in one, the total solids in the classroom is 23.9. The fat is 6.7, protein 14, and the antibodies, which is extremely important, is six. So you can see there lactose 2.7, minerals 111 and 295. So if we compare this of the second milking, you can see there it dramatically drops. So you have 17.9, you're going down to the fat 5.4, protein 8.4, and the difference in the antibodies automatically there from six to 4.2. The milk in number three here, you can have a look down. And if you look as far as the antibodies, you can see it goes to 2.4. The total solids, 14.1, protein, 3.9. Um, and then you're going to lactose, which is 4.4. So you can see there, by the time you actually get to the milk in number 11, so if we compare number one here, which is your colostrum, which is your first milk in, to number 11, you can see the difference. Total solids, 22, oh, sorry, 23.9, which is going down then to 12.5. Antibodies percentage, you're going six, 4.2, 2.4 and right down as far as 0.09. So you can see there how important it is because that's the actual percentage which is in the classroom um, and how important it is to get that first classroom into the calf to get as much antibodies as you possibly can. The next thing that I'd like to go over here is a refractometer. Now some people probably use um, colostrum, uh, colostrometers which is kind of a float but this is a lot more specific I would say um, and a lot more easier to use probably um, and you can just have a look through it and you can see so if you look up here at the picture you can see this where you place two drops of glassstrom onto the glass screen there you flick over the little plastic thing um, and you put you can look through the eyepiece there and when you put it up to the light it's basically measuring the density of the glassstrom and it'll tell you then you can test one cows you can test two cows you can, as many as you want um, but you'll be able to start comparing each cows off each other to see who is the best colostrum and who doesn't. So I've looked down here and I've said high quality colostrum has an IgG concentration greater than 50 milligrams per mil, which is 22% on this brick scale that we have here. So the brick scale is going to give you a percentage, but it's actually equal to 50 milligram per mil. So colostrum greater than 22% is suitable to feed as the calf's first feed. Colostrum must be measured at 22 degrees because the heat changes the actual proteins and the antibodies, which is actually in the colostrum, you need to take the um, sample at 22 degrees. So it's, it's fairly off that. You can take it out of the cow, we say take sample, and there's a little plastic droplet that comes with it. You take the droplet out of the sample and you just put it onto the um, glass screen and then you hold it up to the light. And it'll show you the density there and then. So the colostrum from first lactation heifers and high yielding cows can be reduced quality colostrum. So although it looks like it's absolutely brilliant colostrum, um, it mightn't actually be as good as you think it is. So freezing the colostrum causes small changes in alteration of antibody levels, but it can be frozen. The colostrum must be thawed slowly and never overheated to prevent damage to the proteins in the colostrum. So when you do find the actual um, best quality colostrum that you have from your cows at 22% or over, you're obviously looking for over as well, it's best to freeze that. It doesn't really change any or has any alterations in it. And once you thaw it slowly um, and you never um, put it in the microwave or, or overheat it, then it'll be at the same concentration. The ability of the calves um, to absorb the IgG is the highest in the first two hours after birth. And after six hours, it's, it's significantly declined. So every hour after the two hours, you know, it's starting to significantly decline. And you can test that even on the refractometer and you'll see it after the hours, it'll start to decline in antibodies. So how to improve practices. So optimum dry cow. So I suppose it's improved practices to get better colostrum, really. So it's optimum dry cow nutrition to ensure the high quality colostrum is produced from day one. So if we have a problem this year with colostrum and you start testing and you're measuring how many have good colostrum and how many have less colostrum, next year then we need to start to look at, well, how do we improve this colostrum? And that starts during the dry cow nutrition. Hygiene and colostrum collection. 
So store four degrees for a maximum of 48 hours. Higher temperature increases bacterial growth and reduces the absorption of antibodies. So the more bacteria that's actually put into um, when you're getting your classroom ready and you're, and you're um, giving it to the calf, any bacteria that comes into that will lower um, the actual absorption of the antibodies. So it kind of interferes, we'll say, with the antibodies, the bacteria. So if there's bacteria there and the tubes are dirty and um, there's, the area is dirty and it's not clean, even with the best quality, it'll start to decline um, with bacteria. So never microwave, as I said before, the classroom um, gently and no greater than 50 degrees, um, avoid destroying your antibodies. So at 50 degrees, you're destroying your antibodies at that. So you could give the classroom, but the antibodies have actually reduced that much that when you do give it to them, um, you're getting a very, very low amount of antibodies or none possibly, depending on what heat is there. So the next thing I just wanted to quickly cover is um, cell count. So to kind of, I suppose, look at this and say, well, what is a cell count to start with? And then you'll be able to kind of look in your head then when you're going around and, and looking at the different factors that's causing this problem. So if you look here on the left hand side, you'll see a red blood cell. So this is actually what's in the milk. So this is inside the cow and this is actually what's happening. So there's a red blood cell there. And on the right hand side, you can see a leukocyte. A leukocyte is a white blood cell. So this is what they look like. They're two different things. This is what we're measuring. We're measuring cell counts coming in um, as a milk quality. We're measuring white blood cells, which are leukocytes. Over here on the right hand side, you can see a normal sample coming in to us is like this. There is so many of them. So if you look down the very bottom, it'll say somatic cell count. I don't know if you can see my pointer, but I have it on. And you'll see uh, mammary epithelial cells. That's basically just skin cells. And in here, you'll see white blood cells. So there's three different white blood cells there. And a normal sample over here, you can see just white blood cells in it. Why is there white blood cells in there? White blood cells are fighter cells to fight off infection. So that's what they actually are. So they have to be in a sample. And they're in, in humans and in, in every animal. There's so many white blood cells there. Getting ready, we'll say, if an infection comes in, we're going to fight it off. The abnormal one, which is coming in, which is a cell count problem, has all of those white blood cells. But as you can see, it's filled with blight white blood cells. The reason why it's filled with blight white blood cells is because it's fighting off something. It's now had to get its arms. And that sample is full with white blood cells, which means to us coming in, there's something gone wrong, it's an indicator that there's something here that needs to be sorted because this animal is showing up that they're fighting some sort of infection. So that's basically when you get the cell count problem, that's your indicator, that's how you're measuring it. The next thing I need to talk about, I suppose, is antibiotic resistance, how it happens, lots of germs here together, antibiotics kill the bacteria, all the bacteria, good and bad bacteria, when anybody takes an antibiotic, it kills everything. But the drug that's resistant, so if you gave it, uh, we'll say penicillin, and you were resistant to the penicillin, you gave the drug, and the penicillin doesn't work at all. So it kills all the good, all the bad, and then it leaves you with this resistant drug here, which is your penicillin or whatever you're resistant to. And then it can transfer it over to others. It's called horizontal gene transfer, and it can actually get one bacteria, can transfer it over to the other, and then you become completely resistant to that um, penicillin or amoxicillin or whatever it is. But it's actually the bacteria that's making it resistant. So you could give that drug 10, 15 times. It doesn't make any difference because that drug has already built up the resistance. So you can give it to the cow, but it won't cure her and it won't do anything for her because it's built up resistance. So here, the culture and sensitivity testing, which helps us to sort out the mastitis problems um, in a repo that we have at the moment, is this is what it looks like in the lab. As a quick overview, the milk is sent in. You can see the round circles here. On the left-hand side, those round circles, no, sorry, the first little dots are basically penicillin, amoxicillin, and all the different antibiotics that we test for. And everybody tests, or anything you're going to give, the tubes that you give on the ground, that's the actual tubes right there. So they plate them up, put them into this actual um, culture here. And then those round circles are telling you this antibiotic works or it doesn't work. It's killing the bacteria or it doesn't kill the bacteria. You can see there, there's some of it really killing the bacteria and then there's other ones that it does absolutely nothing to the milk at all on the slide. Nothing, it hasn't even changed it. 
But the other ones that are working are obviously massive circles there. So really and truly, I'll go on to the CMT test in a minute. The big thing with the resistance is when you get mastitis outbreaks or you have high cell count cows now coming in, you really need to be doing the CMT test before your milk accordance so that you can identify the high cell count cows so that you can then decide, are you going to treat them? What are you going to do with them? What drugs did they get at drying off? What did they get penicillin? Did they get amoxicillin? And did that work? So did they, were they resistant when they were dried off? And are they calving down now at over 200, which means they have a high cell count um, and we need to get them and sort them before we even get as far as the milk accordion. To do that, this is the CMT test. You can get it in any of the stores. Um, it's dye and it'll show you up. Um, I have videos there. Anyone wants to use them and it'll show you up exactly which quarter is over 200 and it'll show you a high cell count cow um, when she calves. Now, you have to give a few days, obviously, because the stress levels are up and there'll be white blood cells there because of the um, high levels of stress. If she's the first calver, especially. So um, you need to leave a few days for her to kind of settle down um, and for the counts to settle down. And then start doing CMT tests and start identifying them early, getting them early, and then deciding what you're going to do with them. And then that will keep your cell count down going forward. So I suppose the, the milk recording. So you're looking at the start of calving here, which we have on the 25th. I know it differs on every farm. So basically your CMT test is going to nearly bring it down to the next measurement before you actually reach the 25th of March. So you're trying to get between the start of calving and that first milk recording with your CMT test. So you can start to um, look and see what are we going to do with these cows? They're high cell count cows. They didn't dry off probably. Is there resistance in it? Is there not? So I suppose you have to look there between that time and try and identify that area of it. The, I suppose the targets that we have is that we want the cows calving under 200. So this is a, a dry cow problem. They had resistance in the herd. The antibiotics at drying off didn't work because, as I was saying earlier, I know I skimmed over, but as I was saying earlier, the bacteria had already built the resistance. They could have been dried off with penicillin or amoxicillin. And now we're calving down with cows that are over 200. So this is the area that we need to get them because then we have figures here on finding out what um, cows are calving down over 200 and, and what our cure rate was. Like here, you can see at the very bottom, the cure rate over the dry cow period is the number of cows that calved on under 200 in the recording prior to calving and the recording afterwards. So that's given us the figure from the first milk recording, which is extremely important. But if we want to go to the next level and try and get those high cell count cows and find out what's going on, we need to go back to the CMT test before we do the first milk recording. And then the first milk recording will give us these figures and these figures are available for everybody on ICBF so that they can um, have a look at them and start targeting to reduce it. Now, quick overview of the upcoming farm regulations. So um, from Friday the 28th of January on 2022, these new veterinary uh, medicine regulations um, will come into force. So they're in law. So um, five days, so all antimicrobials, including those administered in feed, will require a prescription, which will be valid for a maximum of five days from the date of issue. The prescription will be filled within the five day time frame, and you can treat the animals for as long as is specified by the vet and the prescription, which is, I suppose, why everything really ties in what we've been talking about, doing the CMT test, milk recording is so important, doing the culture and sensitivity testing, starting to measure, and then you can use all this data to get the right tubes for the right cow and then reduce your own costs. So you're reducing your own costs really by measuring and by keeping, an, I suppose, a, a record of everything that's going on. So any existing on the 2nd of February, sorry, any existing prescriptions that you have for specific antimicrobials like mastitis tubes for cows will no longer be valid from the 2nd of February. So any of the prescriptions that you have now, they're not going to be valid after the 2nd of February. A requirement for farmers to move towards selective dry cow strategies for mastitis control, which involve a more targeted use of antimicrobial treatments. So I've basically covered over there very swiftly over the areas that you can start looking at to start doing a more selective dry cow and more targeted antimicrobial treatments. Not alone does it reduce the resistance in your herd, 
but it'll also reduce the amount of money you're spending on tubes. So you don't need to spend them on them um, unless you have some measurements to say, well, yeah, I do have a cell count problem and it is definitely the antimicrobials. It may not be. Those white blood cells that are in that sample could be something totally different. And you need to try and identify why those white blood cells are in that sample before you can say, okay, a tube will fix it or something else will fix it. There's no real silver bullet to it. So basically moving to a more targeted use of antimicrobial treatments will reduce, I suppose, the um, output of antibiotics on your farm, but it'll also save you money. So there will be tighter controls in relation to certain antimicrobials called highest priority, critically important antimicrobials, as these drugs are our last resort for human health. So that resistance that we were talking about earlier on, that's actually happening in human health. And there's people dying every day of the week and every month of the year from antimicrobial resistance. So those actual high priority drugs need to be kept for human medicine because obviously they're gonna try and treat the humans and then they're gonna to come to the cows. So the high priority needs to be kept now for humans. Only a small quantity of antimicrobials can be kept on your farm to cover a specified risk of disease as determined by your vet. So they're gonna get a lot more stringent, I suppose, on just giving the antimicrobials out. So this is why if we have all of those different services and the tests that I've ran through, it'll save you of going in, looking for antimicrobials when you don't actually need them, you mightn't require them. You may require them. If you do require them, you will get them. There's no problem because animal welfare always comes first. But it just depends on if you need them or not. So to do these measurements and to have a look and use your milk recording data that you get on ICBF is going to be crucial going forward. Just a minute now, Magella. Okay. So the requirements at this actual topic here um, isn't a topic that we're going to cover tonight, but I just said I put it in. The requirement to only supply antiparasitics, so that's dosing, medicines on foot of a veterinary prescription, it has been deferred until the 1st of June. And after that, you're going to need a prescription then for antiparasitics, so dosing, um, taking your fecal egg counts, doing all the different things, I suppose, make it more efficient. So that's everything for me. I know it was a quick, um, I suppose, uh, whistle top tour of everything that I could and I know it's probably very hard to just cover it over there but <clears> if there's any <throat> questions or anything there's no problem. Thanks very much Magella. So now at this stage I'm going to hand over to Vivian Silk our Chagos region manager and there's still time to put your questions in there to our panelists so over to you now Vivian and thank you very much Magella for your talk. Yeah, viewers um, the first question I have Donald I'll let Magella catch up right there for a minute the first question we have is, 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 I suppose, is a simple enough one. And, and you might feel it on, please. What is the best fertilizer to use with sorry when you're spreading it? So it depends really on the time of the year. So first, if we bring it back to spring, if you're putting the slurry on a uh, milk and platform, like say if, you went on, if it went on at two, two and a half thousand gallons, uh, gallons per acre, it's applying a lot of the P and K you need. But it, like if you put down that slurry, you shouldn't need to follow with the half bag urea as well. Um, but again, it depends what this slurry you mean to be using for. Like if it's being used for silage ground, your 3,000 gallons of slurry would provide a lot of the P and K and maybe top it up with your three, two and a half, three bags of can or um, good sport to top it up. But it depends what that slurry is actually being used for. Maybe just for the purpose of even done with the, with the topic that you covered, maybe just uh, specify it on, on maybe the grazing platform and what you led to it. So, yeah, well, it depends, depends, like, first of all, like, if you're putting slurry on the milking platform, that's fine. Say it gives you your 21 units of nitrogen, so replace that. But then it comes back to what's the P and K status of the actual soil you're putting onto. If it's on index 1, 2, you're going to have to follow it maybe more with, with yeah, maybe 18, 6, 12s. If it's on index 3, you probably have a lot of the P and K to deliver at that stage. You might be drip feeding it with your 27, 2 and a half or something like that. But again, it depends on the actual, also the stocking rate, like you're stocked at 2.5 cows on the making platform, you're stocked at 3 or 4. There's going to be a lot more offtake on the 3 or 4, do you know? Okay. And, and as you said, the refer to the soil sample is crucial to, to, to view those and not just to, you know, go with fertilizer for the sake of it, especially, especially this year in the price of it. I think it'll really focus the mind. Okay, second question, Don, which is, is I suppose somewhat related. Um, how much meal would you recommend to feed during the first rotation, uh, assuming you have pretty good grass supply? Um, I'm going to give you another political answer for that one. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, it depends what your output, your target output is for the year. Okay, so first of all, bring it back to what's the genetic potential of the herd, what's the age of the herd, what's the milk production at the moment in terms of fat and protein makeup again. 
like what's the grassland management on the farm is it all received is a good quality grass um again what's the biggest one is like what's your silage quality is there more silage going into the diet what percentage of silage in the diet so if you want to make a rough rule of thumb if you're at grazing full time grass which most people around here wouldn't be but here if you are you get away with probably two or three kilos if you're on if you're on maybe three four days out of grass or out by day and in at night you might have to up that to around four kilos but if you're in full time on good quality silage you'd be definitely going five to seven kilos definitely you know so the biggest one there is grass quality and grass silage um which is it, it's going it, that's uh, how much has been fed really you know there's like looking at the samples coming in there's a huge variance between the silage quality that's coming in you know and if you have poor quality silage you're going to have to make it up with meal um, Magella, just uh, back to back to you for for a moment. Um, and you mentioned it a good bit through your talk. What are your thoughts, experiences, possibly on on the use of non antibiotic mastitis treatments, or have you experienced of them? Yeah, I suppose. Look, they work on uh, some farms, and it depends. Um, I don't think there's any harm in giving them, but I don't have any um, any records or any research done behind them to say that um, the, the, the cow didn't bite off the white blood cells herself, or, you know, I just don't have the research at the moment to say that it was definitely that that um, actually got rid of the cell count or got rid of the different things. So it could work very well and it works very well on some farms, but I just don't have the research at the moment to say it definitely works. But I suppose it's, it's a fair assumption to, to, to make that with the change legislation that people will look at these more and examine them more and there may be some trials on them at maybe at net farm level or research level or whatever. Yeah, and that'd be fantastic. And then we could, you know, it'd be excellent. Like, but we, I suppose we can't really say definitely until we have the research done behind it to say, you know, okay, this is definitely going to work. Okay. okay. Um, another question for you, for you, Michelle, while you have the, um, while you have the microphone. Uh, what semantic cell count are you trying to reach after Kevin? We'll say, what's the typical target there? Yeah, so you're trying to calve um, after, we'll say, um, you need to give them a few, a while to settle, to you know, first. And then you're looking to be trying to get under 200. Under 200, like, under 200,000 cells. Okay, and that's, that's um, um, achievable for most people. Yeah. So if, if they start going, you start getting, we we'll say, patterns of them calving down at over 200, then you need to be start looking into, well, why are they calving down at over 200? What happened? Was this in the dry cow period? Is this now? Is it the milking machine? What's actually happening here? So you need to try and figure out why are they? But I suppose unless we measure it, we won't know why they're over 200 when they're calving down. And by the time we get to our first milk recording, we have the figures, but we're nearly firefighting it at that stage. Do you know? So. And um, you mentioned it in your talk, but it's probably no hair to repeat it. What length of time do you have to get the colostrum into the calf so the calf will perform well from it and gain the gain the resistance? As soon as possible and below the is definitely two hour cutoff point. So you need to get it in long before that, like if you possibly can. Um, obviously, as soon as you can, the quicker it goes in, the more antibodies is in it and the more the calf you get. Okay. And again, a related question to colostrum. Where can you get a, refract, a refractometer? You mentioned in your, in, your, in, your, in, your, in your talk, or are they widely available? Yeah, so um, you can get them in a few different places. Um, you can get them online. Um, it's a pretty good one. You just have to make sure that it's a brick scale. So um, you can get them on Amazon there, or um, you can go into stores as well. They're in them as well. Um, and it'll have a brick scale on it, and you can use it then for the percentage of glassroom that's in it they're fairly handily got you know if anyone needs any help or anything they can get in contact with me and i'll um, send them on links and they can order them online oh i'd say 10 15 euro oh, you can actually yeah. buy one from 10 to 15 euro and you can buy another one that's three four hundred euro so there's okay. a massive range right. Right. whichever right. one you want to go for yourself you know <laughs> <laughs> okay fair enough fair enough uh back to you donald for the next couple of questions um, can you can you outline the difference in the value of a slurry using the splash plate, which I suppose we're trying to get away from as much as we can, versus a trailing shoe? You mentioned you mentioned some of this in, in your talk as well. Yeah, so uh, if we look at a splash plate versus a trailing shoe, you, like for every thousand gallons, you could be looking at around between three and four units extra per thousand gallons. So if you had a two thousand gallon tanker with low emission, you could be talking about an extra eight units nitrogen in that tanker alone. You know. And the, 
the, the I suppose the environmental um, the environmental savings with it and 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 um, the better use of the nutrients is, is crucial for that. Exactly, yeah. Like here, the low emission is one of our uh, one of our tools in the armory as well in terms of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. But not only that, in terms of reducing ammonia levels, but also here there was trials done as well in Chagas in terms of residuals of low emission versus splash plate and using low emission, you get a lot better residuals in terms of grazing out paddocks as well. So there's a lot of benefits. Not only, as you said, not only just the nitrogen being recovered. Yeah, just driving around the county the last couple of days and, and, into, and into last week as well, visiting, visiting the various offices that we have. There was a an array of, of uh, slurry spreaders going around, and still quite a good few a good few splash plates to be seen. Um, which I suppose they're there on farms, but we'd be trying to move everyone as much as we can over to the to the more efficient levels, and also in terms of the environment and and the savings and the you know the pressure that's on there as well. So you know it's just it's, I passed a, a, a trade um, a trading a trading firm today. And there was a lot of trading um, old splash plates on the on the on the on the way in. So obviously they're traded in, so it's good good thing to see. But we want to see more of that, I suppose. Um, just another question on 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 sorry, Donald. Let's just come in there just the last couple of seconds. Uh, what is your view with high ash content silage due to slurry contamination in grass silage with the LESS slurry applicators? Yeah, so slurry going into the silage. Yeah, Kel, I've heard of all right uh, problems. I suppose first of all is just to make sure that that slurry is well diluted when it's been put out. You know, and don't be putting out massive excessive rates like three thousand gallons of slurry should be low to achieve um, silage yields that you want. Also, as well, if you could, if ground conditions allow on, allow on silage ground is to put out that slurry, for example, earlier so that it will have dissolved in the soil um, better before harvesting. Like if you put that slurry out earlier, it's not as if the PK is going anywhere. That PK will be there for that silage crop. OK, so it gives a better distance between cutting and application date. Um, one other question, Donald, related to question. Um, is there, if there, sorry, if there is clover in the sward, uh, do we need to reduce the nitrogen in the spring or, or what do we need to do there? Yeah, so first of all, I suppose, um, no, um, not until roughly up to the start of May, uh, middle of April going to May, the fertilizer advice will be the same going to that point, but then it's from the 1st of May, you'll be changing your advice in terms of nitrogen strategy with the clover incorporated. Now you want a good level of clover in that sward to reduce the fertilizer to get the the nitrogen going into the grass plant in terms of but also if you like i suppose i have seen articles on how to reduce nitrogen this year and clover as mentioned but if you slow clover this year uh well especially white clover it's not going to deliver the nitrogen this year like the clover plant would have to be it's in situ for at least eight to nine months before it's going to deliver nitrogen for you okay final question and maybe magella uh, magella you might maybe might answer this one please um in terms of the protected area, we're, we're talking a lot about, I suppose, within Chavis. Um, have your stores got it available, and is 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 it is it there for farmers if they if they order if they look for it? Yeah, it is available, and um, they do have to order it though. So it is available, and obviously we want everybody to be um, implementing protected area, but they it is available, but they'll have to order it. So. Um, can you comment on the, the farmer demand uh, in your stores at the minute? Yeah, Angela? there is there is a good farmer demand for it, and um, they are looking for a protected urea, um, as they realise the benefits of it with um, you know, lower emissions, and um, I definitely think that it is one thing that we're definitely promoting. Um, but I think that they need to order, I suppose, and need to already plan it out and and do it in advance because um, there is a, a shelf life on it, so it needs to be ordered in advance beforehand. Thanks very much, uh, both. Uh, Magella and Donald, and I'll hand back to Brendan uh, for, for the final comments. Thank you very much there, Vivian, and we're just about out of time there this evening, folks. So I'd like to thank our two panellists there, Magella and Donald, for great presentations there this evening, gave a lot of information, and thanks to Vivian there for facilitating the questions and answers. Um, and indeed, look at most importantly, thanks to you at home for engaging with us here tonight. We hope you found this webinar beneficial. We'll be getting the webinar uh, recording uploaded to our Chagas Mayo YouTube channel in the coming days, so keep an eye out for that. All that's left for me to say is that we'll be back again next Wednesday night, um, where we'll be having a webinar on preparing for lambing, uh, ways to reduce lambing mortality, uh, with local advisor there, Liam Quinn from Chagas and Westport, and well-known sheep specialist, specialist there, Damien Costello from Chagas and Athenry, joining us next Wednesday night uh, at 8 p.m. So indeed, uh, you know, we hope to see as many of you as well uh, on that webinar as well. So all that's left for us to say is good night from us all here in County Mayo and stay safe this spring, folks, and see you all again next week. Bye, folks. Thank you.